in Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, reading from verse number 32, the Bible tells us, Fear not little flocks, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Fear not little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Here the Lord Jesus Christ is telling his audience not to be afraid. He's saying, do not fret. Don't be afraid. And the reason, you know, and the reason the Lord is telling his audience not to fret and not to be afraid is revealed in that same verse. He said, do not be afraid because it is your father. It is the desire of your heavenly father to provide for your needs, to meet you at the very point of your need. Our God desires to give you the kingdom. Okay, that is the reason why you should not be afraid. Okay, our Lord is now saying that if the Lord's desire is, if, the, if it is the desire of the Almighty God to give you the desire, the, the kingdom, which is more important than anything that you might want to desire in your life. He said, don't you think that the Lord will meet you at the very point of your needs? If the Lord can give you the kingdom of the, the kingdom of heaven, what is it that you are asking for on a daily basis that the Lord will not be able to provide? That's basically what he's saying. He said, don't you think that the Lord will meet your daily desires? Don't you think that he will meet you at the point of your need? So, so therefore, relax, because your father in heaven knows what you need and is willing to give you the kingdom. But that's not where the story is going this morning. Now, I want you to understand that the fact that somebody desires to give you something or desires that you have something does not necessarily mean that you are going to have that thing automatically. Okay? The fact that somebody says, okay, I want you to have X, Y, Z. There are certain factors that may make that may not make it possible for you to have that thing that you desire. So the fact that God desires us to have a kingdom does not necessarily mean that we are going to automatically have the kingdom. Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, if you read from verse number 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, which means whatever promise God makes, God is able to deliver. Whatever God says he's going to do, he's able to do. He says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. As some men count slackness. But it's long-suffering towards what? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In other words, God is not willing that anybody should perish and be eternally separated from him. That's not the intentions of God. The Lord's intention is that all of us will come to repentance. But you and I know that not everybody is going to be saved. Okay? Not everybody's going to go and dwell eternally with the Father in heaven. Every, we all know that. And is it because God does not want them to be saved? No. It is the desire of the Almighty God that each and every one of us be saved and dwell with Him eternally. But some of us are not going to be. And the result is because of some of the decisions that we make. We make up our mind that we say, no, I don't want the salvation. I don't want the sacrifice of Christ. I'm not willing. It's not, it doesn't make sense to me. I'm not interested. So the fact that God desires to give us the kingdom, the fact that God desires to give us an inheritance in the heavenly places does not mean that everybody's going to get it. That's what I'm trying to say. Not everybody will get it. The fact that God desires the best for you does not mean that you are going to get the best. And I say this because of what Jesus Christ himself said in the book of Matthew chapter 11. If you read from verse number 12, the Bible tells you, it says, for the days are from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. In other words, our Lord is telling us to obtain that which the Lord God Almighty has prepared for you. To obtain the kingdom that the Lord desires to give to you, there is a need for you to earnestly strive against some opposition. In other words, you can't just stroll in and possess your possession. Okay? Yes, your father wants you to want you to have it. It is the desire of your mighty God for you to enjoy the blessings of heaven. But the Bible is making us to understand that there is a need for earnest striving to be able to get into it. You can you have to engage, you have to be involved to obtain the kingdom of God which the father desires to give you. There's a need for some level of forceful advancement against the host of hell. You know, there's a need for some forceful advancement against the host of hell. You need to be able to fight. You need to be able to advance against opposition that doesn't want you to move forward. There are forces who are determined to say, this is what the Lord has prepared for you, but I'll make sure you don't get it. Jesus. There are people, there are forces that are. And if you want to get what you want, if you want to get what God has made available for you, you must be able to fight that particular opposition. And it comes in different fashions. For some, it comes in the form of depression. 
For some, it comes in the form of opposition. For some, it comes in the form of bad friends or bad relationships. For some, it comes in bad choices. It comes in different ways. You are going to be the one to say, no, you are not going to rob me of the things that God has in store for me. So, it requires some thoughtful advancement for us to be able to obtain the kingdom of God, which the Father desires to give us. There is a need for some level or for some aggressive contention against the powers of darkness. Some aggressive contention. You need to kind of fight it. When the spirit wants to pull you down, you need to be able to say, no, I am not going to be, I'm not going to be taken over by this particular feeling. I'm not going to be under the oppression of the enemy. I'm not going to allow the enemy to be able to steal my job. I'm not going to allow the enemy to take my children or to be able to put my child in a, in a particular kind of bondage. It's a, it requires aggressive contention with the powers of darkness. And finally, for you to be able to obtain the kingdom of God, which the Father desire and desperately wants you to have, there is a need for some relentless contention. You continue to fight. I remember telling you one thing that about the Christian faith, the beauty of the Christian faith is this. It requires consistency. In other words, it's not that you do it today and you stop. Because as soon as you stop, the enemy comes. The Bible says the enemy walked to and fro, looking for who he will devour. As soon as you lay down your armor, the enemy takes advantage of it. So it requires a relentless contention. The Bible says that when Jesus went to, into the wilderness to go and pray, the enemy came. And the enemy kept on pursuing, pursuing, until that particular point in time when the Lord Almighty said, when the Almighty said, you know, it is written, it is written. And at that point in time, the Bible says the enemy left him for a season. Didn't leave him completely, but left him for a season. Which means there is always going to be an opposition of hell. There's always going to be that fighting. There's always going to be that contention. It is now left to you to say, I'm not going to allow the enemy to take to do, you know, to take uh, to steal from me. I'm going to continue to be on my guard. So that is what the, that's what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying. So you see, for us to obtain the kingdom of God and the blessings that God desires to give to his people, there's a need for us to be engaged at some level. You have to be engaged. We cannot sit back and expect the blessings of heaven to be delivered unto us. We cannot be at ease and expects to be able to possess the blessings that God has and so forth. Our Lord is saying there's a measure of fighting that is required. There's a measure of warfare that is required if you are going to enjoy what God has in store for you. Okay? There's a measure of uneasiness that you have to feel. A lack of comfort in the situation that you are. And say, Lord, I want to be able to move in the middle. I want to be able to move forward. And that's why the Bible tells us in Jude 1 verse 3. It says, Beloved. When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. In other words, the Lord is saying, for obtain the kingdom of God which God wants to give you, there is a need for an earnest contention, a serious fighting, a passionate struggle, to say, Lord, this thing that you have for me, I must get it. This thing that you have spoken concerning me must be my portion. I don't want to read about it only. I want to experience it. No matter how long it takes, the enemy is not going to keep me down. That is a decision that you make. And that's why the Bible says you should earnestly contend for the faith that was delivered unto you. You fight for your children. You fight for your husband, your wife, your relationship. You fight for your business. You fight for your health. You fight for everything that pertains to you. Because if you don't, the enemy has a free day. And you have nobody to blame. Because the Lord Almighty made it available for you. It is Lord for you to take it. And so throughout this month, we have been talking about, you know, in our Sunday Sermon series, we've been talking about accessing your divine inheritance. Okay? And in our first installment, we looked at the very first way in which you can access it. And we say that the way you access it is by forging a meaningful relationship with the Almighty God. We say that for us to access the riches that God has in store for us, it starts with a relationship. And it means that we have to be born again. You cannot access the blessings of heaven when you are an enemy of the Almighty God. When you have no relationship with Him. There has to be a relationship with Him. We must be born again to access our divine inheritance. In our second installment, we talk about the second strategy. And that second strategy is that we need to purge ourselves. We need to cleanse ourselves from every form of filthiness. Cleanse ourselves from sin. Okay? 
purging ourselves from sins means that we remove the obstacle that will not allow the hand of God to touch us. Anything that God looks at and says, no, I can't deal with this particular temple, those things will take away. And because the one thing we must understand is that the purer you are, the more accessible you are to the presence of the Almighty God. The purer we are, the more the Lord Almighty finds us useful, the more we become more valuable in the kingdom. And our value in the house of God, our usefulness in the house of God, our access to the treasure of heaven is a function of the level of purity. The Bible says in the Father's house there are many, you know, there are many vessels, vessels of honor, vessels of gold, vessels of silver. He said, if any man pours himself, he said, he will become a vessel of honor that is fit for the master's use. In other words, the filthier the vessel, the more likely the Lord will not even look in that direction. But the more beautiful the vessel is, the cleaner and the well kept the vessel is, that is a go-to vessel for the Lord Almighty to use. So we are saying, for you to access what God has in store for you, purge yourself. Form a relationship with him, purge yourself, and then what's happened is that the Lord now finds it very easy to interact with you. And so this morning, in this, you know, as we continue in this series on accessing your divine, uh, your divine inheritance, we are going to be looking at the third strategy for accessing that particular area, uh, accessing what God has in store for us. And the way we access it is by doing what? Is by contending with the forces of opposition that will not allow us to be able to access what you want to, you know, to be able to get what the Lord has prepared for you. There are some of those, you know, when you are playing, you go to your place of war, you are walking and there are individuals whose intention is to sabotage you. The promotion that you are looking for, that advancement you are looking for at the place of war, there are people who say, no, if I don't get it, nobody else will get it. And they will do everything possible to sabotage you. What do you do? If you want to move forward, are you going to just sit down and watch them? They say, well, what will be, will be. If you do that, you are not going anywhere. But if you make up your mind and say, okay, you don't want me to go, I am ready to deal with you. Okay. You will begin to take actions that will make sure that nobody is able to stand against you. Nobody is able to block your progress in life. And so this morning, we are going to be talking about contending with the opposing forces that will not allow us to enter into the place of rest and get that which the Lord Almighty has in store for us. In Joshua chapter 1, Joshua chapter 1, reading from verse number 1, the Bible says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, my servant, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all these people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place the sole, the sole of your feet shall tread upon, I have given to you, as I said to Moses. In other words, the Lord is saying, there is a place that I have prepared for you. There is a blessing that I have given unto you. I spoke it unto your great-grandfather, to your father, to your ancestor, Abraham. I said I was going to give them a place. I was going to build a nation for them. And where all the people that came along, I kept repeating the same promise. And now you are at the very edge of that promised land. You are about to enter and possess those things that I have promised unto you. And the Lord is now saying, number one, this particular promise, whatever I promise to give you, does not depend upon any man. The fulfillment of what I say I'm going to do in your life is not a function of if everybody supports it. It's not a function of how many people are traveling with you. It's not a function of how powerful connections you have. It is not dependent on any man. That's why he told him, number one, Moses, my servant, is dead. The more you look to a man, the more you are going to deny yourself of the opportunity of enjoying the blessings of God. That's what the Lord was telling Moses, telling Joshua. Joshua, don't look to any man. Look unto me because I'm the one that made the promise. Number two, the Lord was telling Joshua, and he's saying, for you to access your divine inheritance, I need your participation. I can do it, but I don't want to do it alone. That's why the Bible said that we are co-laborers with God. We are partners with God. There is a thing that God will do that there are things that you must do. You must do your part for God to do his part. God will not do your part and you cannot do God's part. And so he's telling Joshua, he's saying, I need your participation. He said, now therefore arise. If you sit down here, you will never be able to get into that promised land. If you sit down here, you'll never be able to possess those things that I have promised to give unto you. And so therefore, I need your participation. You have to be actively engaged in the process if you want to get what God has promised you. And then number three, the Lord was saying to Joshua, Accessing your divine inheritance requires your offensive action. In other words, you don't go to somebody who has your stuff 
Somebody who has stolen your stuff or who's occupying your space and say, well, I want you to get off this place. You know, it's a, you know, God has promised me. He told Abraham, my father, he told uh, Isaac and Jacob that this land belonged to us. I know that you have been here before, but I want you to leave now. And the guy said, okay, yeah. Hey, but I remember God said it. Yeah, we had that conversation. Okay, you guys, pack your load. Let's go. The people who own the land are here. That's never going to happen. That is never going to happen. The guy will say, uh-huh. And so, God told you I was going to give you the land. I am here now. Look for another one. And then you say, no. They said, I said, no, I said, I am not going anywhere. And then there's going to be conflict. And the Lord was telling Joshua. He's saying that if you are going to get this land that I'm telling you. He said, everywhere the sole of your feet shall tread. In other words, that's the place where you are going to have this offensive fighting. There's just going to be this particular confrontation. There's a place where you are going to have to be able to challenge the, the powers that are resident there. And unless you dislodge them, you are not getting anything. Unless you are willing to uproot those powers that have sat down at the place that God has given unto you, unless you are willing to fight for that place, you are not getting it. There are powers that are sitting on the life of our children, sitting on our families, sitting on our businesses. Unless we are willing to go to their root and say, this one the Lord has given unto me, you are not taking it. And you are willing to fight. Those things will never be able to be released. And so the Lord was telling Joshua, yes, take your eyes away from man. Engage in the process. But you need to be fighting. You need to fight this particular battle. You need to fight the battle. The Lord was saying to Joshua, a clear assurance I have given unto you. This land belongs to you. I have given it to your fathers. I've given it to the, to the patriarchs before you. And I'm saying that for you to get it, here are the things you need to do. And Joshua had a job to do because the, order, the Lord already gave him the, str the strategy for winning. And so in Joshua chapter 6, when Joshua finally woke up to the realization that he had to be engaged and he had to fight for the land, the Bible tells us in Joshua chapter 6, reading from verse number 1, it says, Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. In other words, the land that God has given to the people of God, the land that he has promised them for generations that they are going to possess. All of a sudden, the people of God were now ready to take it. And the Bible says that the enemy shut the door. You can't go in. Yes, I know it belongs to you. I know your fathers were promised this land. I know God has been telling you about this particular land. But we are here now and we shut the door. The Bible says that the land was now closed. So that even the people that God has promised that land were not able to possess it. And so you see, there are so many things that God has promised you. You sleep and you get the revelation. God tells you what he's going to do in your life. You read the Bible and you see the promise of the Almighty God. That I, I know the thought that I think towards you. Yeah, the thought of good and not of evil to give you an expected end. I know, that, I know that you may prosper and be in good health. Even as your soul. There are myriads of promises in the scripture. But for some reason, the doors are closed to those promises. And you begin to wonder why. The Bible tells us. That Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. Nobody had access to the blessings of heaven. And the Lord said to Joshua, this is what the Lord now can do. You remember Joshua and the Lord is in partnership. And the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given you this Jericho, given Jericho into your hand. It's king and the mighty men of valor. In other words, don't look at what the enemy is doing. Don't look at the gates that are shut. Don't look at the impossible situation. Don't look at the depression or the challenges or the things that are happening around you. Don't look at what everybody is saying that you can never move forward. That you always remain like this. Don't look at them. The Lord is saying, see, I have given Jericho into your hand. It's king and his mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you, all you men of war. You shall go around the city once. This you shall do six days. The seven, uh, and, the se and seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of horns ram, of a ram's horn, sorry, before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, uh, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. And then the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. That was the strategy of the Almighty God. That was what the Lord is saying. You don't need to fight. Just follow my instruction. Just do what I ask you to do. What are the things that the Lord has been telling us to do? What are the things that the Lord has been telling you as an individual to do? 
And the, as long as you follow that instruction, the Lord will do his own part. And that is exactly what he's telling Joshua here. If you fast forward to verse number 15, the Bible says, But it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day, only they marched around the city seven times. Verse 16, and the seventh time it happened, when the priest blew the trumpet, that Joshua said to the people, shout for the Lord has given you the city. Now verse number 20, the Bible says, so the people shouted when the priest blew the trumpet. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout, that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. But it requires, number one, their engagement. And it requires their participation. They were not sitting down in their camp and sipping pina colada. And then all of a sudden they say, the wall fell down. If that was the way, it would have been excellent. All I had to do is just sit down at home and say, Lord, I want to get that promotion. And voila! I get the promotion. All of a sudden, Lord, I want to be able to, I want to rise to the best level in my place of work. And all of a sudden, it happened. If it doesn't require my participation, every one of us will be as successful and will become like Elon Musk very easily. But it doesn't work that way. You have to participate. You have to be involved. You have to march around your own Jerusalem, your own Jericho. You have to be able to listen for the sound of the trumpet, the sound of, sound of the homes ram. You have to be able to shout that the Lord has given you the city. You have to follow the instruction that God has given unto you. You have to be willing to fight. That's the only way to go on. And so you see, the particular passage that we read in the book of Joshua illustrates for us that accessing your promised inheritance requires your active involvement. You cannot sit down and just expect life to happen. You cannot sit down and expect success to just fall on your laps. It doesn't work like that. And anybody who tells you that is the way it works, that person either doesn't know what he's talking about or they are lying. It doesn't work like that. Even God himself requires you to walk. Walk is not a taboo. Walk is not a curse. Walk is not something that God uses to punish people. Remember when there was no sin. The Bible said that God made the garden and he took man and put him there to tend the garden. You have to be productive. You have to be engaged for success to be part of your story. If you are not willing to do that, then you can kiss success goodbye. But the Lord Almighty is saying, to possess the promised inheritance, there is a need for us to be involved. You cannot outsource that responsibility to somebody else. Number two, accessing your promised inheritance from the verse of the scripture, the passage of scripture that we read, requires your productive engagement. It's not just involvement, but you must be involved doing what you are supposed to do, following the instruction you are supposed to follow. The Joshua and the people of Israel could have been there just doing their own thing. But the Lord said, no. When you get down to, Jer to, Jer to, uh, to Jericho, I need you to march and to march in silence. And I need you to do it just once in six days. On the seventh day, I need you to do it seven times. If you are going to follow the instruction and be engaged, it has to be productive. You have to know exactly what you're supposed to do and do it the way you have been instructed to do it. Okay? I used to tell some, you know, there was this uh, guy when we were in high school. He would say that the student that failed, it's not that the student did not study. He just studied the wrong part of the book. Okay? He said, you know, I don't know how to translate that, but that is the best translation I can give you. It's not that he didn't study. He just read the wrong side of the textbook. <coughs> it's not that people are not working. Most people are not lazy. They want to work. But it's their work. A targeted productive engagement. Are you doing what is going to take you to where you are going? Or you are just doing something? Some people are just happy to be called that they are busy. Busy doing what? What are you engaging? Is your production? Is your activity? Is it a productive activity? Or you are just a busy body? And the Lord is saying here, I need you to be productively engaged doing the things that I've asked you to do for you to see the result that I'm telling you that you are going to get. Number three, accessing your pro uh, promise uh, inheritance requires a forceful advancement. 
The Lord says that when you hear and you have marched for you have marched for seven times on the seventh day, and then you shout, He said, Now you are supposed to advance in front of you. You are supposed to be engaged and advance so that you can take the land. When the wall fell down, if you stand there, you are looking, wow, God, you did this? The wall fell down? This is wonderful. We need to calculate the seismic effect of this wall falling down. We need to look at the impact of the wall when it fell on the ground. And we need to do, if you are sitting down there doing the calculation, all the children of Jericho would have disappeared. Why you are sitting down there doing your calculation? But the Lord said, no. As soon as the wall fell, he said, go and take the land. So there has to be that forceful advancement. No matter how intimidating the situation may appear, we cannot stand still. That's what the Lord is saying. You cannot remain on the same spot. There has to be that advancement. There has to be that move to push forward and get what God has said, you know, he has promised unto you. And then, in other words, you cannot be detached. You cannot be easy. You cannot take life easy and be a spectator and not expect that, yes, everything will fall on our lap. It doesn't work like that. The Lord is saying to Joshua, there is a measure of fighting, a measure of warfare, a measure of, of engagement that is required for you to possess your possession. And the question is, why? Why do I have to fight? Why do I have to engage? Why do I have to be exact myself? Why there has to be a spiritual warfare? Why do I have to fight? Why is warfare necessary for you to possess your possession? Look at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Let's start reading from verse number 7. In Revelation 7, reading from verse number, uh, sorry, Revelation 12, reading from verse number 7, the Bible says that there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angel fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was there place found, for, found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So the question is, why do you have to keep fighting? Why is fighting necessary? My brothers and sisters, fighting is necessary because there is an age-long battle that is always in existence. There is a battle between the forces of good and forces of darkness. The Bible said there was war in heaven. Before you and I came into existence, there was war in heaven. And that war is still ongoing. And you want you to, I want you to understand that the battle you and I are facing is a battle between the, that the enemy has waged against the almighty God. The devil, though he has been defeated, is still very much opposed to everything that God represents. And anyone who is aligned with the almighty God will definitely face the wrath of the devil. So it is, but, and that is why you have to fight. Because there is an enemy. There is a war that is going on. And the beautiful thing is that you cannot stay in the middle. You cannot be the Switzerland in the church. Okay? I'm not for the right, I'm not for the left. No, you have to take a stand. It's either you are with God or you are with the devil. There's no demilitarized zone in this war. And so that is one of the reasons why we're fighting. Number two reason why we fight for our inheritance is because of the presence of the hostile adversary. The Bible tells us that the dragon and his angel were cast into the earth, which means they lost in heaven. This is the only place where they have the opportunity and they are going to show anybody who doesn't know. They are going to show them pepper. They are going to fight that person to the point that that person will come to a standstill. So there's a presence of an adversary. That's why you fight. There are those who believe it. There are those who do not believe it. My intention is not to convince you to believe. My intention is just to let you know it exists. Okay? And my prayer is that you will not see the fight of the devil. Okay? Love will not allow you to see the fight. If you see it, you will know. But that's the story for another day. We fight because, number one, of the age long battle. We fight because of the presence of the adversary. And number three, we fight for our inheritance. Fighting for an inheritance is necessary because of the ongoing opposition of the host of hell. The enemy has not stopped fighting. Okay? The enemy has not stopped fighting. The enemy is still going on fighting. The Bible tells us that he, the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world, which means his operation is still going on. If you read the book of Job, the Bible says that when the sons of men were gathered, Satan was there. And God had to ask him, what are you doing? He said, I'm coming from, from going back and from going forth. The man is just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So if you are not careful, you become one of his praise. 
So we fight because there's an ongoing battle. You do not take your, your, your weapons of war and hang them up while the battle is on. If you do that, you become a casualty of war. And so we fight because there's an ongoing battle. And so you see, my brothers and sisters, it is necessary for us to fight and engage the forces of hell in warfare because we need to confront and to contend the enemy of God's plan for our life. If you don't confront and confront and contend with them, they will take up what belongs to you. I don't know whether anybody has ever had or experienced or known of anyone who has been a victim of, uh, of bullying. As long as the bully is there and the bully is never challenged, the bully will keep doing exactly the same thing. Until the day you say, no, enough is enough. You are going to beat me, but I will make sure today you are going to see Pepe. And then you start fighting that person. By the time you put up a resistance, that bully will come to an understanding that this one is no longer going to take the nonsense that I've been dishing out, and so he will look for another victim. That is what the Lord is telling us here. That if you, you fight because you need to confront and to contend, and when you confront and contend, that is when you, you are able to access and dislodge whatever the enemy you know, whatever the Lord Almighty, you know, the, uh, whatever the, uh, space that belongs to you that the enemy is using up. Okay? The Bible says that I set before you, uh, I've set you over nation and over kingdom to root out and to pull down. In other words, what belongs to you, there are powers that are sitting on it. And you cannot take possession of it unless you first of all root out those strangers in the land. And that is why you need to fight. That is the purpose of the warfare. Number three, it is necessary for us to fight and to engage the forces of hell so that we can possess our inheritance and then secure its benefits. Because unless you fight, you will not get what is yours. And if you don't get what is yours, you cannot possess what is rightfully yours. If you don't possess what is rightfully yours, you cannot secure it. And so that's why you fight. You don't fight because you don't have anything to do. You don't fight because you just feel like fighting. You fight because there is something that belongs unto you. That promotion belongs unto you. That healing belongs unto you. That deliverance belongs to you. The advancement, the, 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 the things that God has written concerning you, they all belong unto you and for you to enjoy them. You have to be able to take it back from those who are holding them captive. And then finally, it is necessary for us to fight and to engage the force of hell. So that we can not only possess our possession, possess our inheritance, but we can also be established and prosper in that which the Lord has given unto you. When you fight and you defeat the enemy, what happens is that the enemy stops messing with you. There is what is called a doctrine in international diplomacy that is called mutually assured destruction. And that was what was established during the Cold War where the superpowers in the world at that point in time, they both had nuclear power. And they both understood that if you become trigger happy, both of us are going to be destroyed. So what happened? They came to an understanding that I won't press my own as long as you don't press your own. Okay? You only do that when you are strong, when the enemy recognizes that you are strong. But if you're a lazy guy, say, who are you? Me making agreement with you. He slaps you around. Okay? But because you are of equal strength, or because he knows that you are stronger, because you have the backing of the Heavenly Father, he stays away. And he just watches you. And then he doesn't mess with you. He knows the line that he can draw, that he will not pass through that line. Because if he passes through that line, he's going to be whooped. And so you must understand, the reason why you fight is so that you can possess your land, you can be established, and then you can prosper. But if you do not begin to fight, you will find that prosperity becomes very difficult. Establishment becomes very difficult. You are fighting the same battle over and over and over and over again. And the enemy is just saying, well, this one, I think, be careful. Um, we, have, uh, we have given him something to do. We have given him work to do. So what happened? Let him be busy with that. We're busy with other people. So you fight to establish yourself. You fight so that you can prosper in the things that God has given unto you. And so there are some, you know, and these are some of the reasons why we fight, okay? And until we confront and contend with the enemy, until we displace the enemy and root out the occupying forces that are taking possession of the things that belong to God, we may not fully enjoy the inheritance that God has given unto us. But when we take time to contend, when we take time to fight, what you will notice is that the enemy becomes subdued. Because when I challenge the enemy and I say, no, I'm not going to take that nonsense. What happened? The enemy will find another victim and leave me alone. That's the way it works. If you are not willing to say no, 
But you take all the crap that the enemy shoots at you, the enemy knows that this one's an easy target and he keeps on bringing the same set of rubbish into our life. But when you stand up and you fight and you take a stand, the enemy is subdued and he leaves you alone. When we take the time to challenge and defeat the enemy, peace and stability becomes our portion. Because when the enemy leaves you alone, at that time, then the sons and the daughters begin to do what they're supposed to do. Business begins to flourish. Promotion begins to happen at the right time. We begin to do the things that we're supposed to do at the right time. When you have been able to get, get the hand of the opposition out of your life. But as long as that evil forces keep coming in, as long as those little foxes keep coming in and they keep creeping, you'll find out that when you push them away, they come back again. You push them away, they come back. Instead of you traveling, you are busy fighting battles that are un completely unnecessary. And so you see, peace and stability becomes an illusion. But when you fight, number one, what you do is that you subdue the enemy. Peace and stability becomes our portion. And then we'll begin to be established and then we'll begin to flourish. Okay? Let's assume you have just one hour a day to pray. Okay? And you have no problem with your finances. You have no problem with your children. You have no problem with your, with your health. What do you spend that one hour doing? Lord Almighty, I want to go to the next level. That's what you're going to spend that hour doing. I want to advance. I want to, I want to move forward. That's what you spend that one hour doing. But assuming you have that same one hour, but there's sickness. There's problem in the family. There's problem in finances. There's problem at home. All sorts of problem exists. When you get there, when you want to pray, what do you do? Oh, Lord, deliver me from this one. Oh, Lord, deliver me from this one. Oh, Lord, deliver me from this one. The other guy that has no problem, he says, oh, Lord, move me forward. Oh, Lord, move me forward. The two of you are started from the same spot. This guy does not have the same baggage that you have. What happened? The guy is moving forward. Meanwhile, you are still battling the same issue over and over and over again. And that is why we need to fight and win the battles of our lives. That's why you need to fight and dislodge every power that is occupying our place of destiny. And when you fight them, that is when you become established. That is when you begin to flourish. And then that is when rest becomes your portion. Because you are no longer worrying about those kind of things anymore. You are not worrying about the devil running after you. You are not worrying about bad dreams. You are not worrying about the sickness. But what you are worrying about is how do you move forward? How do you multiply? How do you bless other people? How do you pray for other people? The reason most of us are not able to pray for other people is because we have our own boatload of problems that we're praying on. Why do I have time to be praying for somebody else? I have my own issues. But when the Lord Almighty has dealt with the issues of our life, it becomes easy for you to intercede for other people. So my brothers and sisters, we, when we fight, we establish ourselves. When we fight, we have peace and stability. When we fight, we put the enemy to flight. And as a result, rest becomes our own portion. You start beginning to enjoy the rest of God. And then finally, when rest comes in, that is when you begin to enjoy the inheritance of heaven. That's when the blessings of heaven begin to multiply in your hand. That's when whatever you lay your hands upon begin to prosper. Because the devil is no longer there to trouble you. That's when your children become a blessing unto you. Because they are no longer, there's nothing there to be able to disturb. That's when your business begins to prosper. Because you are not fighting the person who wants to destroy it. You've already won the battle. Prosperity becomes your portion. Inheritance, you access that inheritance. The reality of what God has promised you becomes you know, evident in your life when you have fought the battle. But when you refuse to fight the battle, or you postpone the battle, or for some reason you choose not to fight, or you believe that the enemy does not have any business with you, so he's going to leave you alone. What you are going to see is that the inheritance that God has promised you becomes an illusion. Inheritance becomes elusive. You keep hearing about it, but you will not be able to see it. You keep talking and seeing people come and give testimonies, but your own testimony does not come. Not because God doesn't like you, but it's because you have refused to do what you're supposed to do. Not only that, when we refuse to challenge the enemy and confront the enemy, what you find is that there is going to be a constant intimidation by the devil. It's like a bully. The day you continue, as long as you allow the bully to do whatever he wants to do, he will constantly be intimidating you. There is this group of people in Lagos. They call them Abuota, area boys. Their job is that they stand in the, in, the, in, the, in the garage, in the motor park, and their intention is just to collect money. You know, they are like touts, street touts. As long as they continue to harass you and you give in, they keep making money. But the day you say, no, I'm not paying you a dime. Initially, you are going to fight. 
They will bring in their people. You might get injured, but there's going to be a serious fight. But if you are able to prevail against them, that is the last day they will trouble you. The same thing here. You are going to fight the enemy. There's going to be a period of fasting, period of prayer. People will look at you and say, oh boy, now you killed Jesus. You know, those kind of questions. They will ask you, when you fight, the day you prevail, that is when everybody starts giving testimony. When you say, praise the Lord, come and join me, sing hallelujah, everybody joins you at that point. In time. That is when you have won the victory. But until then, the enemy continues to intimidate. When we refuse to fight, what you find is that your walk with the Almighty God becomes inconsistent. Okay? When you refuse to fight, your walk with the Lord becomes inconsistent. Why do I say that? Can you imagine, I'm asking, okay, next Saturday we are going to have the Breakthrough Prayer Conference. But that next Saturday, you are dealing with issue at home. You are dealing with issue at work. You are dealing with issue in your health. You are dealing with issue in finances. They are telling you that you have an opportunity to be able to make some extra money. Oh boy, what do you do? Life is difficult. So what do I? I go for that one. Your work with God becomes inconsistent. But when you have dealt with certain issues in your life, you find out that your work with God, your commitment to the kingdom becomes more consistent. These things affect each other. When an area of our lives is still being influenced by the enemy, you find that other areas will be affected. And so when we refuse to fight the battles that we are supposed to fight, inconsistent work is one of the results. It's not because you don't want to serve God. It's not because you don't like, they like God. But there are people who say, in other words, the thing that you are going through, the challenges that you are facing, is not allowing you to focus on the right things. It's not because you don't want to focus. Not because you hate God. Not because you don't want to do the things of God. Not because you don't know the benefit of serving the Lord. But there are so many competing priorities that your attention is divided. And that's what the devil does. So when we refuse to face the battles of our lives, inconsistent work is a result. Number four. When we refuse to face the battles of our life, then you have un unending battles. Our people used to say something that when a small problem knock you down, sorry, when a big problem knock you down, a small one start crawling on top of you. Okay? When big issues become an issue in your life, you find that that's when you begin to have all sorts of, necess all sorts of nonsense crawling into our life. The people who are not qualified to speak to you will now begin to give you instruction. That's what happened when we refuse to fight the battles of our lives. And then finally, when we run away from the battles of the enemy, or we refuse to challenge the enemy, or we refuse to take a stand against the enemy, what you find is that the absence of God's rest, God's rest will become absent in our lives because you are going to be troubled. There's going to be trouble on every side. There's going to be concern. There's going to be questions. There are times when you want to do things and because of other things that are happening, your mind is not at rest when you refuse to fight the battles of your life. And for those who say, Lord, I don't want the enemy to keep harassing me. I don't want the enemy to continue to steal my lunch. I don't want the enemy to continue to steal, to kill, and to destroy the things that God has promised unto me. What do I do? How do I make sure I confront and I defeat the enemy? How do I do that? My brothers and sisters, confronting the enemy and winning the battle starts with an understanding and a knowledge of the uh, and a knowledge of the enemy. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, it says, We are not ignorant of the devices of the devil, which means when you are ignorant of the device of the devil, the devil will mess you up. But when you are knowledgeable about the battle that you are fighting, when you have a good understanding of what it takes to be able to fight that battle, half of the battle has been won. When you understand this is the strategy of the enemy, that the enemy is whispering into our ear, the enemy is sowing seed in our heart, the enemy is giving us to be able to go into our feeling, into our emotions, the enemy is giving us, is allowing us to be able to project ourselves into other people and making us to think that yes, this is what they are saying about us. When you understand the strategy of the devil, he no longer be able to work on you if you do something about it. So, try engaging. The enemy to be able to access, uh, you know, to be able to access our inheritance requires your understanding, your knowledge, and the understanding of the enemy's operation. And that's why the Bible says that my people perish for lack of knowledge. When you don't know, the enemy will eat your lunch. Number two, engaging in spiritual warfare to access what God has in store for you requires a desire and a determination. Okay. It requires a, detire, a desire and a determination. You have to say, Lord, I don't want to continue living like this. I am tired of this lifestyle. I'm tired of this thing that is happening. The people who are making it, who are, who are advancing in life, they don't have two heads. 
Some of them are not as intelligent as I am. Why is my condition this way? Why is my situation like this? That was what Jeremiah was saying. He says, is there no palm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why is it that the health of the daughters of Zion is not improved? Why am I in this situation? You have to have that desire. There has to be a hunger in your spirit to say, Lord, I don't want to continue to live like this anymore. Until that desire comes in. Until that hunger comes in, until that fire starts burning inside your belly and determination backs it up, the enemy continues to have his way. Number three, engaging in spiritual warfare to be able to access what God has in store for you requires persistence and preservation. And this same persistence comes again. You have to be persistent. You have to continue to fight the battle. Even when it looks like the only time you are defeated is when you stop fighting. But as long as you keep shaking your head, as long as you keep getting up, you keep, you remain in the battle. You look at the two people who are fighting in the, who are in the ring, who are boxing. You may knock the guy down 500 times. As long as he's still getting up, he is still in the fight. And if you don't take time, if you become careless, he might give you one right uppercut and you fall down. It doesn't matter he has fallen down 500 times before that time. As long as you fall down, you can't get up, you are out. So as long as you are persistent and you are saying, Lord, I will not take no for an answer. This particular situation, oh God, these are the things that you have promised me. And the Bible makes me to understand that you are not a man that you should lie or the son of man that you should repent. Whatever you say you are going to do, you are going to do. And Lord, I know that you are going to do this thing. The enemy, my buffet, the enemy might put a barricade on my way. But Lord, I am willing to fight this battle to the very end. As long as you are persistent and you preserve and you persevere and you endure, the Lord Almighty will give you the victory. But if you give up, if you let go, if you stop fighting, you have given the enemy the victory. And that will not be our portion in Jesus' name. And finally, my brothers and sisters, engaging in spiritual warfare to access the blessings of heaven for your life requires you to be aware of and to rely on the spiritual resources that God has made available for you. There are several resources that God has made available for you. I'm talking about the power in the name of Jesus. I'm talking about the Holy Ghost fire. I'm talking about the word of your testimony. I'm talking about the Bible. I'm talking about the, you know, the praise of the, in the lips of the people of God. I'm talking about the fellowship of the brethren. I'm talking about all the resources of the scripture that the Lord has made available unto us. That's why the Bible says that he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. There are so many things that God has made available unto us, but you need to be aware of them. And that's why I tell you to read the scriptures. Bible says, therein you have life. You have, you need to be aware of it and you need to be able to rely on and deploy those resources so that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Almighty God is able to raise the standard against them. But if you don't know, how are you going to fight it? If you don't use it, how is it going to benefit you? So to be able to win the battle so that you can access what God has in store for you, you need to be able to know the weapons. You need to be able to use the weapon that God has made available unto you. The question now becomes, are you a candidate? Am I a candidate of the person who is able to engage? Who is that person who will be able to fight the battle and win? The person who will fight the battle against the enemy and get access to what God has in store for him must be the person who understands the nature of the opposition. You have to know how the enemy works. The Bible says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness, of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. You need to know who you are fighting. How that person fights. The strategy of the person. If you don't know, you are going to be fighting like you are boxing the shadow. You are, fight, you are fighting air. The Bible makes us understand that for you to win, you need to know the nature of your opposition. Number two, for you to win, you need to be engaged in the battle. Not talk about the battle. Not read about the battle. Not complain about the battle. Not philosophize about the battle. Not say all sorts of things. But, but you need to be engaged in the battle. And you engage in the battle on your knees. You engage in the battle with the word of God. You engage in the battle through praise. You engage in the battle by being able to give testimony. When the enemy wants you to be silent. By being continually holding on to the hem of the garment of the almighty God. And say, Lord, I'm not going to give up on you. That's how you fight the battle. When the enemy expects that you are going to pull your head under and begin to soar and say, why me? Oh God, what do I can't do now? Why you not do me like this? If you keep doing that, you are wasting the time. The enemy is winning. 
But when you say, Lord, regardless of what is going on unto me, just like Job said, he said, even though he slays me, I will yet praise him. That's how you fight the battle. You fight it like the children of the three Hebrew children. When the Nebuchadnezzar was saying they have to bow down, he said, no, we're not going to bow down. Then you throw us into the fire. He said, even if you kill us, we're still not going to bow down. That's how you fight. When you take the word of God and say, Lord, I hold on to this word. I don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't know what, what the enemy might do, but I trust in this word of God. The Bible says Abraham, knowing that God is faithful, he said that even when he knew that his body was dead, he continued to believe that is how you fight the battle. The man who will win the battle and access the blessings of heaven, number one, must know the nature of the enemy. Number two, must be ready to engage and fight in the battle. Number three, must be able to deploy and use the weapons that God has made available unto you. And then number four, must be able to use the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as a weapon and depend upon the spirit of the Almighty God for direction. You are not fighting in your own power. You are fighting in the power of the Almighty God. You are not fighting in your own wisdom. You are fighting in the wisdom of the Almighty God. So you depend upon the one who has fought and won the battle. You depend on the weapon that he used to be able to win the enemy, which is his blood that was shed for us on the cross of Calvary. That is how you fight and win. But most importantly, you depend, you, you, you build your faith on the victory that Christ has won for you on the, battle, on the, on the cross of Calvary. The Bible says, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even unto death. In other words, they know that Christ has won the battle, and they rely on him who has won the battle to fight for them. So that's how you win the battle. These are the kind of men, these are the kind of women who are able to take a stand against the enemy and be able to possess what the Lord, the land that the Lord has given unto them. The question this morning is that, are you that kind of a person? Am I that kind of a person? Do you know the nature of the battle that is fighting you? Do you know the challenges that is facing you right now? Do you know the origin of the problem that is facing you in your life, in the life of your children, life of your family? Are you willing to be able to take a stand and say, Lord, no more. You have done this all through this year, but this year, I am not going to allow you to do it. You are no longer going to continue to steal from me. You are not going to destroy. You are not going to kill the blessings of God in my life. You are no longer going to continue to occupy the place that belongs unto me. This year, I am taking my stand. And I am taking back that which belongs unto me. If you are that kind of person, I want you to bow your head and begin to talk to the Almighty God.